welcome to our brand new show, Tea and Whiskey with Caroline and Don. And we're coming at you from the fight capital of the world, Las Vegas, ahead of UFC 285 this Saturday night. We're at the Sahara where Tough Enough is going down behind us, but cannot wait to bring you this show and of course introduce this legend sat beside me. Here's the UFC Hall of Famer, UFC 8 winner, UFC Ultimate Ultimate 96 winner as well, and one half of that 2002 fight of the year with Takiyama, Don the Predator Fry. Yeah. How you yeah, doing? I got lucky. I had a good run there. That's uh, a lot of accolades. I that's was... a lot. Yeah. You know, it's almost like you had, a good thing we had tea and whiskey here. I had to take the whiskey <laughs> away from this gal. But my God, this woman just, she was groping all over me. Just like like being with an octopus, man. Can you keep your hands to yourself once? That's not in the script, but all right then. You keep drinking your whiskey. Right. But why did they think that you'd drink the whiskey and I'd drink the tea? I don't know, but yeah, I'm taking I'm taking away from you now. All right. Well, maybe because I'm from I'm from England, but they've given me an energy drink as my tea substitute, so we got to work on that. But, but look, Don, we are in the fight capital of the world, Las Vegas, and some iconic fights have gone down here from UFC 100, UFC 200, Tyson versus Holyfield 1 and 2, Ali versus Holmes, and let's just reminisce a little about, bit about some of those incredible fights and, uh, and your memories of some of those. There are a lot of incredible fights here in Las Vegas. Um, you know, the, the geezers at Caesars with Ali and Norton, that was something else, or not Norton, I'm sorry, Ali and Holmes, and then you had, uh, shit, who, who we got here? Oh, let's look at the list, Leonard versus Hans, Tyson versus Holyfield 1 and 2, Oh, I mean. Tyson, Tyson versus Holyfield 1 and 2 is amazing fights, you know, they had out there, outside the MGM Grand, and, uh, then they had, um, Leonard, Leonard was fought there. I remember watching Leonard fight, and they had to put blankets on the guys in between rounds because wow. it was so cold. Wow. It was amazing. It, the, those guys were athletes. They were real, real good athletes back then. Um, they were boxers. They weren't extremely fighters, but they, you know, but they had the fighting spirit, and the boxing was a, was a lot more technical yeah. at that at that point. Well, so much has happened, and it's still a really special place to fight. But you never had an MMA fight in Las Vegas, is that right? No, never had an MMA fight. Uh, did uh, wrestle here in yeah. college um, at the uh, Las Vegas Invitational. I, I took fifth one year, took third another year, and uh, as a heavyweight. And it was fun. Uh, hell, we, we wrestled till uh, Glenn McMahon and I wrestled till three o'clock in the morning one day. You know, we had eight eight matches that day. Wow, eight it, matches in a day. Yeah, that's what happens when you lose. You know, you, you gotta go through the losers bracket, and they make you pay for it. Wow. Well, times have changed since then. Obviously, you can't yeah. just keep getting back in there, especially when it comes to to MMA. But I want to ask you, if you were to have a post fight celebration in Vegas, what would it look like? Oh, it looked like a lot of flesh, a lot of flesh, a lot of whiskey, a lot of flesh. You know, and it was uh, not not horse flesh either. We're talking, right. we're talking, uh, you know, some good-looking women. I think every time you say something inappropriate, I need you to take a, a thumb <laughs> full of whiskey. Well, hell, darn, we'd be out of whiskey then. <laughs> they haven't given him very much. I mean, top this man up. I mean, look, it's an incredible place to fight. It's an incredible place to celebrate. But what was your favorite city or country to fight in when you, you know, MMA in particular? Oh hell. You know, I fought uh, Japan was where I did most of my fights at uh, Saitama Super Arena. Wow. And uh, they would push the seats back and rearrange it to where we would hit 48,000 people. And then I did a fight against Antonio Inoki at the Tokyo, Tokyo Dome, 70,000 seats. And then they sold um, 5,000 standing tickets, so 75,000 people. And then we did... Um, one year we did a K1 versus uh, Pride fight uh, at the soccer stadium, National Soccer, Tokyo National Soccer Stadium, and there was 100,000 people there. 100,000 100,000 people. people. Wow, I mean, look, I've, I've been to the Satama Arena myself. I think it was, oh, Josh Barnett and Roy Nelson, Josh Barnett coming away with the win then, and those, the Japanese fans are something special, aren't they? I yes, mean, they they're, are. they're so in tune with the fighting, but they don't say a word. No, they're no, so it's quiet. It's quiet. You, you, you go out there and you, you give it your all, and none of, none of you hear a pin drop. Wow. And you're thinking, well, I'm really screwing up. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, that, that, that night against uh, Yoshihiro Takayama, we, 
Nobody could hear anything. That, that place exploded. It was amazing. Well, the Japanese fans might be quiet, but they can certainly make some noise in Las Vegas. There's been so much fan support for John Jones, who we'll talk about in a moment. But I'll just quickly share one of my favorite Vegas fight nights. Uh, 2015, Conor McGregor versus Chad Mendes. Yeah. And Conor walked out to Sinead O'Connor singing live. I mean, the Irish consulate was on alert. There was that many crazy Irish fans. Uh, we've got Callum Walsh standing by here, so oh, I shouldn't call nuts. the Irish I, too crazy. Um, I was there. That was there, there that night. Yep, I and was that, there that night. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think they had that much whiskey uh, in <laughs> Vegas in one night before. They ran out. Yeah. But the co-main event between Robbie Lawler and um, Rory McDonald was, to this day, one of my favorite yeah, fights to watch live. Yeah, that was a great fight. That was great an absolute fight. war. And uh, I think we're going to be in for a treat this Saturday night, so let's get to it. John Jones versus Cyril Garn for the vacant heavyweight title. Of course, Francis Ngannou has left that belt, is now up for grabs. And John Jones, after three years out, comes up to heavyweight. Your first take on what you can expect from John at heavyweight. Well, I don't know, I saw a picture of him. He looked like he swallowed a bantam weight and a lightweight too, you know? He, he, uh, he's been eating good, that's for damn sure. He's a big boy now. He's gonna see if uh, his, his uh, skeletal structure can carry that weight. But, uh, he, you know, even though he's been out for three or four years, he's, he's still one of the best best fighters on the planet. And uh, a lot of people consider him the greatest fighter of all time. And uh, you just don't forget that. that Yeah, that muscle memory, which comes back immediately. And uh, he hasn't been at home sitting on his ass, you know, eating Twinkies and drinking soda pop. He's been out training the whole time. So. And he did say as well, like he said originally this week, that he thought it might just take around three months to pack on that size. But it's taken him three years. And I think gaining weight and good weight, you know, not fat weight, but good weight, and holding on to that heavyweight frame, Don, isn't as easy as it sounds, is it? Packing on that muscle. No, it's not. Back, uh, I was in college, and one day I said to hell with it. I'm never cutting weight again. And I went up to heavyweight. Yeah. And uh, took me a while to get used to it. Yeah. I got my ass handed to me a couple of times by some of the big boys. Yeah. But then eventually I got, I got into the swing of things. Um, John, on the other hand, he, he's, his whole family's big. You know, a bunch of pro athletes. And uh, it looks like he, he's going to be able to carry it better. Yeah, he said from a young age he's been wrestling with his brothers, who, like you said, are, right. are big guys. But a comment was made this week about it's one thing to train with other heavyweights, but to then go in the octagon and be hit by another heavyweight. Is, is it almost going to happen? You know, do you think there'll almost be that little wake up moment of like heavyweight power is different? Oh, yeah, you bet your sweet ass. <laughs> you know, it is a wake up moment. It's either a wake up moment or a go to sleep moment. You know, yeah, one, or one or the other. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I tell you what, I, I think uh, John's got the ability to handle it. But, you know, Gon, Gon's a hell of a kickboxer. If uh, he, he lands that kick at the right moment, the right timing, it's good night for John. Yeah, I think a lot of us are expecting John to lean into his wrestling and that will probably be a strategy, but his fight IQ is amazing. We don't know what John Jones will turn up, but going back to that three year layoff from competition, not from training, as you said, but is there such a thing, well, there is such a thing as ring rust, but how impactful is it? And we talked about this, not so much physically, but, but mentally? Mentally, uh, you know, it'll have... John's had a lot of things going on in his life besides fighting that, that will ruin, ruin the fighter. So we're going to have to find that out if, if he can overcome all the bad things that's happened to him. Um, he's, he's mentally tough, he's physically tough, but there are such things that happen to a fighter which they just can't recover from. But uh, John, John's a hell of an athlete, and Gon's a hell of an athlete, and I, I'm looking for a great fight. When it comes to the conversation of the GOAT, the greatest of all time, obviously John Jones' his name is is mentioned as you know probably arguably he is the goat what's your opinion on that well yeah it's it's uh after don fry he's right there you know he, 
Or who, who, else, who else would you put next to it? There you go. There you go. <laughs> and not only that, but becoming the heavyweight champion. You're, you're the baddest man on the planet. Yes, you are. Do you think that's that extra sort of prestige when it comes to holding that heavyweight belt? Yeah, it's... You know, you get there and everybody wants to see the heavyweights. They want to see the heavyweights fight because they know there's going to be a knockout. If uh, if it goes a distance and it's a decision, it's such a disappointing night for everybody. But uh, generally, uh, the heavyweights knock people out and that's that's how they get the, the legend to go along with it. Yeah, and obviously to be one of the select few to hold belt in two weight divisions. And Don, let's talk about weight divisions for a moment because that didn't exist when you were doing your thing. Like you could turn up at any weight at some point, right? Right, we had no weight, <laughs> yeah, we had like, no weight limits. You're fighting Takiyama and he's standing this much tall of you. How do you prepare for someone that is so much larger than you? And I'll just uh, make a quick reference to the fact John Jones and Cyril Garn weighed in almost the identical weight on the scales this morning. That isn't always the case at heavyweight, but you know what it's like to face Oh, I've fought guys. some big men. I've fought uh, a man named Aki Bono, who is a grand national sumo champion. You know, and uh, I believe I believe he had cut down to 590 pounds. You know, seven foot one. Just hang just, on, say that again. He cut down. Cut from, down. Sorry, loud here. 590 pounds. Dude, yeah, he was seven foot one, 590. Just a, an athlete, uh, one of the greatest athletes. Well, actually, the greatest athlete on the planet in sumo. You know, he is, he's a grand national champion. There had only been 67 of them in the 10,000 year history of sumo. Wow. Yeah. That's not a human being. That's, that's a whole other animal. I mean, that's, that's crazy. It's like fighting a horse. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take a look at some of John Jones' statistics. I mean, his record, the only loss on his record was a disqualification, which a lot of people, and Dana White himself, would love to get overturned. Um, 26 and 1, one no contest. Finishing rate 61%. Um, UFC debut in 2008. He was the youngest ever UFC champion. I mean, all these accolades are pretty impressive. Ask your prediction quite yet. We'll do that at the end of the show. But I feel like you're a proud American, Don, obviously. But if you could just give me one thing you love about the USA and then one thing you love about France before we move on. I love everything about the USA except for the government, you know. All right. <laughs> but like they like uh like Winston Churchill said, you know, uh, all, all governments are bad, uh, dem democracies are the worst, but uh, compared to every, all, all the others, right? Or all right. Is the best compared to all the others. I think I screwed that up. <laughs> I, got, I got the gist, I got the gist. And France, have you been to France? No, I haven't been to France, but uh, UFC 9, that shows you how old I am. They came over to interview, you know, to cover the fight at Joe Louis Arena in Detroit. And they asked if they could interview me. And I said, sure. And I said, why are you so good? He says, nobody else would talk to us. And I said, well, well why? What do you all think of the fighters over there? And he said, well, we think your guys are monsters. You know? <laughs> well, it's only just been legalized in France. That's, you know, that's, right. that's how far behind now, now they you've were. Got, now you've got uh, a guy fighting for the World Heavyweight Championship. Absolutely. We're moving on from that main event to the co-headliner. We have another great in Valentina Shevchenko making her eighth title defense against the Mexican Alexa Grasso. Um, Alexa on a four-fight uh, winning strike. She's ranked number six. I mean, Valentina's just running through the whole division. But Donna, I've got to ask you, what do, what do you know about Valentina? I mean, she's she's a badass, I can tell you that. But, but what do you I know, know about Valentina? Well, I know that um, she, she and I should be making babies right now. I mean, uh, we shoot out a whole litter full of... Um, another sip. Another, another sip. sip. Another sip. Uh, all right. <laughs> Got to keep you I'm in line. I'm a bad boy. Yeah, <laughs> bad, naughty, naughty boy. Well, she is the whole package. She's got it all, I'll tell you what. She is the best uh, woman fighter out there on the planet. Yeah. And, um, you know, just her coming back at this uh, to fight and Jones coming back and fight. It's a special night in in um, Las Vegas here. Yeah, it absolutely is. And Joe Rogan has joked that Valentina, when she's not fighting, is probably a spy or an assassin. And she hasn't denied it. This is a woman that, she lives a bit of a nomad lifestyle. She travels around. She's been training in Japan with sumo wrestlers. You know, really going back to the roots of the martial arts in preparation for this fight. Always looking to get better. And I spoke to her at weigh-ins um, and 
the, that flip had switched. She'd gone from chatty and friendly and lovely, yeah. which she always is, to Well, deadly. all women do that. Come on. You know that. They, you go from a woman, every woman out there on the planet can be sweet one second, and then boom, next second, she's she's got a knife to your juggler. Well, that's what happened today with Valentina. So I know she's absolutely ready to go. Alexa Grasso, if she becomes a champion, she'll be the first ever Mexican-born female UFC champion. So she has a lot to fight for. But, you know, it's, it's hard to write off Valentina with her body of work. But uh, uh, Alexa is, is, is calm and she's focused and, and she wants to get the job done. But in terms of the bigger picture of women in MMA, we're celebrating 10 years since that first fight between Ronda Rousey and Liz Carmouche. But Don, did you ever think you'd see women in MMA? Not unless they were carrying a card, you know, and walking around the outside of the ring. That's it. But Man, I'll tell you what, they proved me wrong. You know, these women, they get out there, they're, they're, a lot of them are so damn beautiful, you, you hate to watch them get beat up, you know? But they're great athletes, and they get out there, and, and they're fighting, putting on better fights than the guys in uh, most of most of these matches. Wow. Oh, you, you think that? You think yeah, that? I hate to admit it, because I'm, I'm the one that said there's no room, no place for women in, in, the, in the fight game, but they proved me wrong. What was the fight or the moment where you changed your mind on that? Oh, heck. I, you know what? I don't know because there's been so many good fights. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Ronda Rousey obviously paving the way. Holly Holmes, you know, was always, she, Holly, Holly always puts on a great fight. Yeah. yeah. These gals, these gals get out there and um, they earn their damn money. Yeah. They really do. And the depth of talent in the women's division is growing all the time. And the women are not just showing up and doing a good fight. They are finishing their opponents. I mean, you talked about Holly Holm. I want to tell you about Molly McCann as well, uh, an English or a Liverpudlian a right, scouser right. fighter. Spinning elbow knockout last year in London. And Dana White said, women don't do that. And she did. So I'd love you to meet Molly at some point. She'll, she'll have a whiskey with you as well. She right. likes like a bevy, as she would say. But, um, you know, have you heard of a scouser before? Heard of what? A scouser. No, I don't think so. You know what a scouser is? Not a clue. From Liverpool, Darren Till, Paddy Pimblett. Like, they're from where I'm from, but a different part of the country with a different accent. Oh, so I'm supposed to understand them. I, I'm barely getting through this talk yeah. with you. <laughs> How the hell am I supposed to understand them? I don't know, I don't know. But uh, look, Mo Molly's fantastic. So many, so many women now that are paving the way and been inspiring to me as well as, as an athlete myself. I mean, I've always, I, I was a former um, international athlete in track and field and in bobsledding, but I always had my own lane. No one's knocking me out of my lane in track. No one's knocking my bobsled off track when I was doing that at the World Championship. So for these women to get in and be so physical, I mean, just a huge inspiration for a lot of young women as well that might want to follow in those footsteps. And, and just for a go on that note, would you, how would you feel if your daughters did MMA though? Because you, you might be all four women doing it, but if it was your daughter, how would you feel? Well, I know they're both mean enough. Oh, That's okay, there we damn go. sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I, I think uh, my daughters are uncoachable, okay. so that's that one I don't have to worry about. That would be that. Like, oh, for right. God's sake, they're mean <laughs> enough. They, scare, they, they they make the devil go to bed early, I'll tell you that. All right, there you go. Well, talking about the greats of our sport to moving us on to the prospects that will be fighting on Saturday night. And one name that's been sort of talked about very much this, this week is Bo Nickel, uh, three-time Penn State, three-time NCAA champion. He won the... Danny Hodge um, Award. He's only the second fighter in MMA to do that behind Ben Askren as well. Yeah, so, I believe so. Those are the only two. Yeah, so yeah. those wrestling, wrestling accolades are absolutely incredible. This is his UFC debut. He's 3-0 in MMA. He's a UFC Fight Pass um, prodigy, if you like, being on the Icon Fighting Championship, George Jorge Masvidal's uh, Fighting Championship. And he makes his debut. How do those wrestling credentials put him in good stead to fight in the UFC? Well, you know, when you're in a in the uh, Division One, Division Two wrestling room, it's like being in a street fight for uh, two and a half, three hours a day, every day. So, you know, you're good to go. The only only difference is there's no kicking and no punching. But when, once you get used to being punched in the nose, <laughs> it, it's smooth sailing. But you, uh, um, some people might not know, you wrestled prior to MMA, yeah. boxing, prior to pro wrestling. You, you wrestled. Yeah, I was lucky enough to be. Um, under uh, the great coach Bobby Douglas at Arizona State University. And then I did uh, my final, I got injured, ended up breaking my neck. Um, 
goofing off with some friends on the on the three wheelers, and uh, we were out drinking and, and having a ro- good time. And then I thought I busted up my shoulder, and, and uh, that's the only thing we found at the time. And then 20 years later, when I broke my neck a second time, the doctor said, "When did you break your neck the first time?" And uh, oh, so you didn't know you'd broken it no, that I didn't. first time? I just thought I bummed up my shoulder. Wow! Yeah. So this was during your wrestling career? Yeah, back wow. yeah, and. Um, so then they put me on a medical scholarship for a year, and I rehabbed myself, and then I went to Oklahoma State University for my final year. I think what we're taking from this is that ref- wrestlers are tough. Well, you know what? <laughs> you, you got you to gotta show up early and all day long to put us down. That's for damn sure. And Bo Nichols been put on the main card, which is kind of unheard of for uh, someone making their UFC debut. And I, I know personally a couple of other fighters on the card are a bit put out that they've been bumped down, namely Drickus Duplessis and, and Ian Gary, who I'll talk about in a moment. But, but how different is wrestling in a cage where you've got the, you've, you've got the cage wall yes. to contend with compared to wrestling on the open mat? It's a lot different because uh, what you well, what you gotta look at is the wall. It's an extension of the floor, and a lot of people they had problems with that when um, when the sport first started, and a lot of people still they still suffer the same problems now too. Though um, for 30 years now, they people have been making the same mistakes, but it's an extension of the floor, and you just work off the wall. It's just we had that. Um, Back when I was at Oklahoma State University, you know, um, Tom, geez, what was Tom Erickson? He bounced me off the wall every day. You know, <laughs> to Erickson, he's 330 pounds. He dribbled me like a basketball. You know, and, uh, it, it, it got me, it got me, got me some good footwork. I'll tell you that. Great. Well, Bo's in action on the main card, UFC 285. Of course, like I said, a, a prodigy, a prospect, if you like, from uh, UFC Fight Pass. He takes on Jamie Pickett, a more experienced um, MMA fighter. Another prospect to look out for, and he will be the featured bout on UFC Fight Pass on those early prelims. Irish fighter of the future, Ian Gary. He's undefeated 10 0, and he takes on Keenan Song. I spent some time with Ian at his, at his house here in Las Vegas. You can watch that, that whole show on UFC Fight Pass as well. One thing about Ian Gary is his confidence. You will not meet a man that confident, and probably on the verge of arrogance, and his wife will attest to that. She said it was actually something she found really attractive about him, but he has this insane amount of confidence. Can that be a dangerous thing, or is that what you need when it comes to putting yourself into the octagon and fighting at this level? That's what you need at this level. Yeah. You've got to have the confidence to know that, uh, you know, this somebody puts a wall in front of you, you can run through that wall. Yeah. That's all there is to it. And nothing's going to stop you. Yeah. Well, he's so confident. While he was having his face off at the ceremonial weigh-ins, he said to Dana White, I'm going to end this guy's career. He's going to retire <laughs> after this fight. So <laughs> we're going to look to see what he does. But look, so many exciting fights to look forward to from the early prelims all the way up to the main card. And of course, that main event, John Jones, Cyril Garn. It is probably one of the stacked, most stacked fight cards of the year. And I cannot wait. I think it's all going to be uh, come down to footwork on these two guys because they're just two big guys and uh, footwork's going to get them in trouble or out of trouble. All right. So I'm going to put you on the spot now. Predictions. Predictions? Predictions. Let's start with John Jones and Cyril Gunn. What happens and how does it play out? Prediction for the fight. Pain. <laughs> I liked it, but I didn't hear a prediction. Go on. You didn't hear a prediction. <laughs> That's because Don's smart enough not to do it. Uh, uh, you know what? I'm going to go with uh, John Jones. Yeah. Because uh, he's an American, and, uh, you know, I'm proud of him, and I'm proud of America. And uh, even though France France is our oldest ally, you know, thank God they, they helped us whoop your all's asses back then, uh, uh, 1789, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you I learned my MMA stats, not my history you're stats. Trying, you're trying to forget that, are you? <laughs> and then moving on to the co-main event, Valentina Shevchenko versus Alexa Grasso. Uh, I tell you what, Valentina, oh, yeah. she's going she to walk through the girl. It's going to be an easy night off for her, as, uh, as always. All right. 
Well, I'm going to bring in now um, another Irish prospect from the boxing world. And here he is, undefeated 5-0 boxer Callum Walsh here in Las Vegas. Callum, I know you're a big UFC fight fan as well. Are you looking forward to Saturday night? Yeah, yeah, I can't wait. You know, the return of John Jones, I couldn't miss it. So, yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'm trying to, I'm trying to watch Ryan stand because I was told, don't touch Don's hat. So, I'm trying, I'm trying to stay away from him. <laughs> so... <laughs> You were warned well indeed. Yeah, yeah. And look, I know you're a big John Jones fight fan and I know you analyze these fights and you're so knowledgeable. Give us a little bit of a breakdown as to how you see John Jones return and how that fight plays out against Cyril Gunn. You know, I've seen pictures of John Jones and he's looking big. Obviously, you know, Cyril Gunn is a big man too. Um, I just remember John Jones from when I was like 15 years old, all that stuff with him in DC. I love that and you know, I, I do. John Jones is, is one of the goats, like he's one of the best fighters ever and I, I see him winning very easily. To be honest, I know Cyril Gain is not a man to be, you know, um, like he's a very good fighter but, but I, do, I do see John Jones just winning easy. He's, he's, you know, John Jones has beaten everybody since he was very young and I think he's, he's very confident and I think he'll do it easily, yeah. So even though a different sport obviously for yourself, was John Jones one of those heroes for you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, to be honest, Ray, I, I've never watched boxing. When I was growing up, I never, I never, never watched boxing. All I ever watched was UFC. But Hang on a minute. Why are you boxing and not doing MMA? Back, back home, back in Ireland, everything is just boxing. Don't we? we don't have wrestling like the Americans are. And I, I don't know how I feel about getting kicked in the head, to be honest. So. <laughs> I don't think being punched in the head is much fun either, to be honest, but um, but that's what you choose to do. And, and look, I know, obviously, the Irish is a big fighting nation. Conor McGregor, of course, and then we've got Ian Gary, oh, that I was just talking about as well. Uh, have you met Ian? Have you watched him him fight? Yeah, I was, at, I was at Ian's last fight. I've never met him. I've never met Conor either. Ho hopefully, this weekend, I finally get to meet him. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to being here to support the Irish. You know, Ian Gary's a good fighter, undefeated, so I'm looking forward to seeing him, yeah. You've got a few thoughts about a certain Irishman and his thoughts on MMA, haven't you, Don? Well, I wouldn't say an Irish man. I would say uh, Irish something or other. You know. uh, that Liam Neeson, what a prick. Let me tell you, that, that guy, he, he, he sits there and he's trying to tell everybody that uh, UFC is just a step above a bar fight. Bullshit. That shows you how stupid this guy is. He doesn't know shit from Sinoa about a fight and let, let's see him make a movie without a gun. If he's so goddamn anti-violence and all that, make a movie without a gun and impress me. Well, I, I, you know, I wanted to let you get on your soapbox to have that moment because, of course, here we know how skilled martial artists are and, of course, boxing being one of those martial arts and you being such a hot prospect. Tell us what's coming up for you next because I know you've got a fight in Boston coming up. Uh, tell us who you're fighting and, and how that's going down. Yeah, I have a big fight uh, in Boston. Um, you know, a big show in Boston, the main event. Uh, I'm looking forward to this being my sixth pro fight out in Boston as well with my, my trainer Freddie Roach is from there uh, so it'll be like a homecoming fight for him too so yeah I'm looking forward to that and I, I meant to say it yeah, yeah I heard Liam Neeson's making a new movie Taken 4 he's coming up for you I'd say but, uh, yeah. is it a movie about cooking? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say yeah, Liam Neeson he's talking all that stuff but I've seen a lot of his movies and, and he's just beating people up in all of his movies you know what I mean so I don't know well, he's full of shit because, yeah, yeah. you know, he's anti-violent, but you know, all yeah, his yeah. movies are violent. Yeah, that's what I so. said. Every single movie is either killing someone or doing right, something. Right, absolutely, like, yeah. absolutely. There you go. And um, Boston, of course, you have a huge Irish contingent and support there. I mean, you've not fought outside of L.A. yet, so this is going to be something special. Yeah, definitely. Going to Boston, uh, I was there once, my first time, and a lot of Irish people there, there was a lot of support, so I'm looking forward to putting on a show for these, these Irish people, and I don't know, anyone that has watched my fights know that I go in there and I do put on a show. I'm not, I'm not afraid to, to stand down and fight, and I love it, and, and I want to put on a show for these people. And I have watched you fight live, and I can attest to that, so very excited to see you in there. Of course, that will be on you, that's Hollywood Fight Nights, that'll be on UFC Fight Pass as well. So, you're going to be there Saturday night uh, at the fights? Yeah, yeah, I'll be there. Yeah. Here at UFC 285? Yeah, yeah, I'll be there, yeah, yeah. Okay. Any other fights you're looking forward to on Saturday? Yeah, I'm looking forward to all the fights. You know, I, I, as I say, I love the UFC, so I can't wait to just be sitting there and watch the fights. 
Well, good luck to yourself with your final training preparations. Enjoy Saturday night. This has been our first show of whiskey, tea and whiskey, whiskey and tea, whatever way around you want to say it. I haven't drunk my tea, but Don's obviously done pretty good I with got, the whiskey. I got it down, yeah. Your tea is looking a little weak there, you know. <laughs> it's not. Okay, for the next episode, because obviously comment in these posts if you'd like to see another episode of Tea and Whiskey with Caroline and Don, but we need to get me some proper tea for this next episode. Yeah, you need a, you need a proper cup, right? Yeah, I need yes. a proper cup. Yeah. Proper English brew. <laughs> there we go. And then we need, we need the crumpets and all the other stuff that goes along with it, too. Crumpets and tea. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tea you know. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, I, I used to have a, <laughs> used to date a bunch of uh, different girls in college. So uh, they'd, all, they'd all bring something different to the party. All right. Say no more. <laughs> Don, it's been an absolute pleasure. Callum, thank you for joining us. You can, of course, watch all of the fight library of the fights we've talked about on UFC Fight Pass. Catch those early prelims from 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. And before that, TJ DeSantis and Chase Hooper will be doing their extra round show right after us. So we look forward to seeing you next time. Next time, sweetheart. Signing off. Just, whoa, watch your hands. She's, she's, she's like an octopus. She's all over you. She's a gropey, gropey. Oh. Cheers. Be careful. See there, she's trying to get me drunk again. <laughs> and thank you for watching.